Hi, my name is Amelia Lyons and I'm a clinical supervisor trainer. Um, today I'm talking to my class about uh, my latest thinking on um, the debate so far in relation to whiteness, racism and these kinds of issues as they relate to supervision. Um, I'm no expert, uh, I've read a little bit around it, but I would say my position is um, certainly not an academic one, um, but one of uh, who's a curious uh, clinical supervisor, who's a teacher to a group in a, in a health board, and um, who'd just like to share some of her latest very fallible thinking uh, in this area um, and very open to debate and comment um, on this as well. Please do that in the YouTube channel on the comments below. As you see, there's many things that I haven't talked about here. Just a few things that I'll touch into. So think of this as a sort of sister companion to working with difference in supervision, where I talk about things a little bit more theoretically um, here, I'm catching you up on really where my thinking is post-COVID, post-George Floyd, um, where I think social media really has probably gone um, in advance, perhaps, of some of the academic thinking in this area at the moment. Things are moving much more quickly now um, in terms of thinking, not necessarily in terms of concrete actions, of course. So the key issues as, as I see them now um, are that racism is, is, I think, becoming much more acknowledged as a white problem um, than it ever has been before. I think, I think white people are really finally recognising, anyone who's a thinking white person is, is recognising that it really is their problem, you know, that it is no longer seen as a black person's problem or a brown person's problem. It's actually a white person's problem. Yes, of course, it's still um, a black person in the sense that they're on the end of it. Um, but it's it's a white issue that needs addressing. Um, and in, in a sense, it's, it could be comparable to the gender issues where sometimes women say, you know, it's it's not women who need to be worrying about their what they're wearing after 10 o'clock at night. It's men who need to be locked up after 10 o'clock at night or... Um, uh, men after a few drinks uh, or, or so on so on and um, women have been saying that for years but I'm still not sure not entirely sure that that's been owned fully by the the male population in the way that I think um, racism now is owned by perhaps the the thinking white person uh, uh, in, a, in a greater sense than it has been in the past a long way to go clearly the idea of white fragility and everything that goes with that, which I'll also touch into in this presentation. The idea that no one can be truly free until this issue is resolved. Obviously, I say resolved in a slightly tongue in cheek way in that um, is anything ever truly resolved. But resolution in the sense that we need to get a lot further down the road than we are now. The idea of tolerating being uncomfortable. So even doing this presentation in some ways it is uncomfortable. It, it's kind of talking about things that white people don't often want to acknowledge. Um, and for me, as a white person, it's difficult to acknowledge this and, and to own my part in, in this. Addressing power dynamics in the supervision uh, dyad, um, that needs to be thought about, and the idea of intersectionality. So um, here I am focusing on race issues as one part of the EDI uh, issue. Of course, there are many, many, um, but I will also touch into race and gender, uh, where things get even more complicated than they are right now. So a great book on whiteness um, issued in, uh, uh, published in 2021 by a woman called Helen Morgan. And that is um, uh, from a psychoanalytic perspective, uh, recognizing that whiteness is, is the issue here and that it has profound implications for us. Um, and it's something that we, we really need to pay attention to. 
Um, she talks about the fragility, white fragility again, the colorblind approach, the silencing process of white liberal families, which are considered as a means of maintaining white privilege and racism. So the sort of conversation goes so far and then it kind of stops. Um, and, and, you know, what happens then? Well, not a lot, actually. So it's obviously not enough. Um, yeah, so, so that, that needs to be addressed. She also looks specifically from the psychoanalytic perspective, you know, as the, the therapeutic dyad and the notion of that being completely cut off from society and obviously argues that that's not uh, relevant or that's uh, not, uh, not enough, really. You can't see it in that way. Um, there's a lovely uh, YouTube um, uh, video called Black Psychoanalysts Speak. And if you look at the, um, there's, it goes on for an hour or there's an 11 minute one uh, and it's worth looking at it um, uh, because um, when you hear black psychoanalysts speak of their experiences in, in therapy, usually with a white person and um, how difficult their therapist found it, no matter how smart they were to acknowledge uh, the racism issues that the uh the therapist in the client roles would talk about um uh the level of denial was was huge um so that's just another area of, of white fragility if you like and that also emerged in my conversation with sadila in another video that i made about um race and supervision uh, with Sadila Hussein and in there white fragility was brought up by Sadila as something that, that would then close her down because if her supervisor found that difficult and sensitive to discuss then clearly she wasn't going to bring it to supervision so so that whole sort of idea of white fragility really serves to shut down the conversation which is, you know, obviously quite a useful thing to do for those in power. I wanted to acknowledge, too, the idea of spirituality and the issues of equality and in the idea that none of us are really free until uh, this issue is resolved. Um, so uh, a lovely conversation uh, that can be found on YouTube between Tara Brach, who's a sort of Buddhist spiritual leader, and Lama Rod Owens and um, uh, within that they have a conversation and Brach argues that you can't separate the work between social transformation and liberation from the path of spiritual freedom really meaning that we can't be spiritually free and still racist uh, so that that is an issue that continues to go on um, until, uh, you know, the two things cannot be disconnected. Um, and that, and that, that's really important to, to recognise that. Um, attending to our social identity, so clearly from a white perspective, again, it means being prepared to self-examine areas of privilege. And then what are you going to do about it? How are we going to um, work as an ally for other people? How are we going to keep up those um, uh, debates about equality uh, in our workplace? What are we, how are we going to contribute to that, into, into bringing about more equality? Owens also talks um, very beautifully about the idea of love uh, and longing for spiritual freedom and that whole sort of podcast or, or, or YouTube video, I think it's on both both means, uh, is well worth a listen. Um, because again, the idea of, of real love has to be all embracing. Um, and again, he's very articulate in this area and is well worth listening to. Um, he, Rod Owens also wrote a book called Love and Rage, uh, Path of Liberation Through Anger. And I love this quote here when he said, I have had to learn to invite my broken heart to dine with me at the table. It is meaningless to run now. My broken heart is not a judgment or a crime. 
It's a detailed record of how I've tried to meet the violence of the world with as much openness as possible. So, then we're talking about tolerating being uncomfortable. So as you can see, all of this is connected really. Um, so what beautifully um, surmises this, I think, is um, Emmanuel Acho's um, shortish series on uncomfortable conversations with a black man, which he sort of introduced post the death of George Floyd, um, who was, uh, as most people will obviously know, murdered by the police uh, in America. And um, obviously that sparked huge outrage and uh, was caught on camera. Um, so we're in this sort of mobile phone era now. So these kinds of things that people clearly got away with for years and years are now being much more exposed. Uh, and Acho uh, beautifully um, on the YouTube channel describes why he, he set up the channel. And there's a, a sort of nine minute discussion there or explanation of uh, he wants to educate white people about um, uh, where the issues are and is prepared to do that through his through his conversations. And he has conversations with a bunch of white police from one of the um, states in America. He has um, conversations with a white pastor, with a mixed race family, uh, with various um, sections of the population. Uh, and it's very interesting and sometimes uncomfortable conversations to watch and to think about. Um, so I, I thoroughly recommend that. Uh, what he also says is that the only way to change is through exposure, education, compassion and empathy uh, and know what you're standing for and why. Um, and and that he does a lovely there's a lovely short film on his channel as well um, with Barack Obama, where Obama responds to his uh, question, what is the cure for racism? So as you can see, that's a deliberately naive question that he puts to Obama. And Obama does his best to respond uh, in a kind of mature and, and helpful fashion. Uh, so Obama brings out sort of four main points, really, which is making sure that the children know about the history and reason for the current inequalities. Um, that people, black people face a uh, legacy of hundreds of years of systematic racism. Uh, it talks about being able to reach out with an open mind and an open heart and not always hanging out with people who agree with you. He feels also that white folks um, shouldn't feel overly defensive or embattled when racism is under discussion and to feel that they can be part of solving the problem. Um, and for black people not to assume that the white person who's uneducated about these issues is necessarily a bad person. So that's Obama's kind of broad response to it, issues. And if I can again go back to that slide that I mentioned earlier. So it's not that um, we that you know that there is any straight pat answer we've all got our own sort of thoughts on it but I think uh, when we're thinking about clinical supervision uh, the idea of of committing to self-examination to being uncomfortable to not being silent when we see something uh, addressing the power dynamic in whatever way we can and, and so on uh, will be helpful. And then finally, if I... Um, so they ask a few questions at the end. I've just picked out a couple of their questions there. Uh, how do multicultural issues and feminist affect your practice? What are some sticky situations and dialogues that you encounter as you try to supervise from one or both approaches? Uh, who is a feminist or multiculturalist that you admire? So for me, that might be people like uh, Maya Angelou, Oprah Winfrey, uh, in the uh, uh, Rene Ide Lodge, 
that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, Barack Obama. So and in feminist terms, there are many, many uh, women that I do admire from Simone de Beauvoir, Gloria Stenham and so on. So, you know, you can think about that. How often do you intentionally raise issues of social justice in supervision? Why and why not? Then if we can just touch into intersectionality, I can just go to the, the last slide uh, where uh, Edo Lodge quotes black poet Audre Lorde, who said, your silence will not protect you. Who wins when we don't speak? Not us. So I think that's a, a really important, you know, often we're taught to be compliant, aren't we? Just to, to shut up and be polite. Uh, don't rock the boat uh, and, and so on. Don't put your head above the parapet. And all of those things can be self-protective, of course. Um, um, but it doesn't change the situation. Uh, in uncomfortable conversations with a black man, when Emmanuel Acho is talking to Carl Lenz, a white pastor in a diverse church, that is really an interesting conversation, quite inspiring to listen to. So I would recommend um, that you listen to that. And Lenz, uh, in that conversation, says, don't be intimidated. Don't minimise what you have. Don't buy that lie, i.e. that you can't do anything. The problem is just too big. The hope of the world is the individual who cares. The hope of the world is the individual who cares. Thank you.